Hi, guys. Okay. Can we have the sound, please? Thank you. Okay, training for you right now, and should come up there. Yeah, that's a video from Ghost in the Shell. Anyone know this movie? Have you heard about it? Yeah, are you alive? Are you a cyborg? No, I'm a little bit of a cyborg today. But don't worry, it's only temporary. Great, so it's really great to be here. I usually like to put on a little bit of a video, so if you guys want to come closer and sit kind of in the first rows, there's going to be lots of images and you'll be able to enjoy these if you sit closer to the screens. I think that up there is a bit useless, so if you want to be able to enjoy the presentation and see all of the slides, please have a seat and come closer. Thank you. Yes, one guy. You too as well. Great. Come in, don't be shy. The Cyberpunk Express is about to depart in about 60 seconds from this station. So please take a seat, strap on for the ride, and enjoy it. Anyone else want to join us? Yeah, we'll give those people a couple of seconds. Enjoy the music. Oh yeah, we got some girls as well. That's good. Okay. I think we're ready to start. Yeah? Let's go. So, actually, uh, like I said, what we've just seen, a uh, video uh, based on the movie Ghost in the Shell. It's an anime, a Japanese animated movie from 1995. Uh, it's very much related to cyberpunk, which is what I want to talk to you all about today. So, let's just get started with it. Uh, Okay, so I'm going to talk to you about how cyberpunk and science fiction became a reality, how it inspired the real hacker culture that we live in today, and furthermore, how we can get more girls and more women uh, inspired to join it. So please join me for this journey. My name is Karen Elazari. My Twitter handle is on the screens. It's Karen E. Please note, all of the E's are threes, so I use this three to spell the E. Karen E. Um, just to remind you all, this is a completely non-smoking journey. So I know you, if you want, might feel like a cigarette, which I do not encourage, emergency exits are located there and there. Please don't smoke next to us, though. Um, a little bit about myself. I was born and raised in Tel Aviv, Israel. I don't know if you've ever had a chance to visit. It's a great place, and I recommend you come over. Uh, I've spent more than half my life, in fact, in the security industry, working with various security organizations, technology companies, and hacker groups. I've been a speaker, an MC, and a DJ at various hacker and security events worldwide. Uh, I owned my first PC in 1990. Were you there? Anyone? Yeah, were you alive? No, most of you seem a bit young. And I had my first web page, uh, which I coded in HTML up in 1994. I was 13 at the time. Uh, for the past couple of months, I've been working with Singularity University, which is a very cool future studies uh, think tank and research center sponsored by Google, Nokia, uh, Cisco, NASA. And it's located at NASA Research Park in Silicon Valley. So a pretty cool place. So what we're going to hear about today, uh, we'll talk about cyberpunk, what's between them, how they got mixed up together, and I'll show you some of the key elements of the cyberpunk genre, the science fiction genre. And then we'll see why hackers are heroes too. And hackers are definitely my heroes. Um, we'll try to see if we can find any lady hackers in the house, any girls, any women involved, and we'll see how science fiction became a reality today. So this is the cover of Time Magazine from 1993. And Time Magazine called cyberpunk uh, a futuristic subculture erupting from the electronic underground. Now let me ask you guys, anyone here feel like they're a cyberpunk? Have you identified yourself with that? Are you alive? Can you understand what I'm saying? I don't have Yossi Vardy's accent, so I, I hope uh, more of you that attended the keynote can understand what I'm saying today. So have you even heard about cyberpunk before? Yes, of course, thank you. Why don't you come here to the front? Oh, you want to sit next to the screen. 
That's good. I'm not going to bring you up here. Don't worry. I'm not Yossi. I don't do that. Unless you really want to come. No. Okay. Uh, so let's see if you are cyberpunks. Uh, this is a self, uh, self assessment questionnaire, also published in a magazine in the 90s. And as you can see, there's lots of technologies involved. Uh, in fact, more than 90% of the technologies on this poster are now obsolete because technology moves at such an incredibly uh, fast pace, right? So maybe the laser pointer, which I have right here, is the only thing that's still relevant from all of the stuff that that guy has up there. But he's still pretty cool. So what really is cyberpunk? What's the official definition? Um, I've seen a couple of definitions. The one that I really liked was a postmodern science fiction genre focused on high tech and low life. So I like that combination, high tech and low life. Really, I feel that cyberpunk expresses pretty dark ideas about the future of human nature, technology, and how those interactions are, go are going to look like in the near future. It's a little bit pessimistic, if you ask me. And the term originally surfaced in a science fiction book by uh, a short story by a guy called Bruce Bethke in 1983. So we can say cyberpunk is almost uh, 30 years old now. That's respectable. Let's see how it evolved. So the look and feel of cyberpunk is usually very post-apocalyptic. We imagine ourselves in mega cities of the future, uh, industrial, smoke, neon lights, cyborgs are roaming the streets. In fact, they're even roaming the stage right now. Yeah. And you have uh, drones patrolling up in the air, people connected to networks from the uh, brain synapses. All of these ideas usually come together in cyberpunk books and movies. And that's really, uh, again, a very pessimistic view of what the technological future we, we will live in might look like. And then let's talk about punk. So anyone here ever been to a punk rock show? Yay, OK, cool. So punk is definitely not dead. Uh, and uh, if you've ever been to a punk rock show, you know it's amazing energies. It's really about uh, disruptive, discordic, uh, anti-system, anti-government, anti-authoritarian. Actually, punk was a, a movement started mostly in the UK in the late 70s, fueled by rock bands like The Clash, The Sex Pistols, and uh, The Ramones in America that really inspire a whole generation of youth to go to the streets, to riot against authoritarian governments, to don't let anyone tell them what to do. So it's a lot about being individualistic. It's a lot about rebellion. It's a lot about doing your own thing, DIY, do it yourself. And frankly, I find it to be very inspiring. So how did punk get involved with cyber? It's not an immediate connection, right? Uh, guys in the back row, by the way, can you hear me? Yeah? Hello? You can't hear me very well? So lots of seats right here. You can come on and join us. You get an upgrade to first class. No, you don't want an upgrade to first class? He's thinking about it. OK, think about it. You stay there in the economy. Uh, <laughs> no, I'm kidding, of course. So uh, earlier today, we heard about some Greek words. Where's the guy that speaks Greek? Is he here? Yeah, anyone here speak Greek? So does anyone actually know what the word cyber means? We use cyber all the time to talk about lots of things, cyberspace, cyber sex, cyber commerce, everything. Anyone know what cyber actually means? No? Where's the guy that speaks Greek? He's gone? OK, so I'll tell you. Actually, cyber comes from the Greek word kybernetas. And the kybernetas is the steersman. That's the guy who runs the show. It's the guy that steers the boat. It's the guy who controls where the vessel is going to. And when the first people started thinking about control systems in humans and in machines, they took this term, kybernetas, and they transformed it into cybernetics, or the discipline of controlling communications in the animal and the machine. So really, that gets us thinking about who controls the vessel or the human vessel and the definition between body and mind and that brings us to a key question that a lot of the cyberpunk movies and books really discuss a lot the question of how technology influences our identity and i'm sure that you've all asked yourself as well especially following the last talk that was here about your virtual identities well uh, 
in movies and books such as Do Androids Dream of Electric Sheep, which inspired the movie Blade Runner. Has anyone watched Blade Runner? Yeah? Okay, great. Well, I have a completely legal copy of it right here. So if anyone wants to watch it later, talk to me. Uh, Blade Runner is based on the book Do Androids of Dream of Electric Sheep, written by Philip K. Dick in the 60s, and then the movie came out in 1982. So one of the key questions in this movie is actually how can we differentiate between androids, synthetic organisms, and human beings? And the way to do it in the movie, the detective Rick Descartes actually uh, makes his subjects go through a Turing test. Has anyone here ever heard about a Turing test? Okay, great. So named after the famed computer scientist Alan Turing, to whom I might add, uh, modern computing owes a great debt. Uh, the Turing test is meant to differentiate between the human and the machine. It's a series of questions that the subject is, is asked, and according to their answers, uh, it's supposed to tell if it's a human or machine. By the way, up until today, to the best of my knowledge, no artificial intelligence devised has managed to break this test. So most of the artificial intelligence systems that have been posed the questions in this test have been identified as an AI. So they couldn't uh, pose as humans. So we're not there yet, but the future is coming and it's a bit scary. And this is a very important question for us to ask. So what if we can't differentiate between humans and androids? So what? It's a very interesting question because right now we're already living in the science fiction uh, days. We're already part human, part technology. We're already becoming post-humans. So we really have to think about it, right? Uh, especially if you consider movies like Robocop and Johnny Mnemonic. So uh, Robocop, I'm sure you've all heard about that. And Johnny Mnemonic is a great movie. Uh, the reason why I like Johnny Mnemonic is actually because uh, Keanu Reeves, really it's his best role yet. He plays the role of a 40 gigabyte flash drive. So really, I feel like that's the best match to his acting capabilities. I'm sure you will agree on that one. Thank you, guys. And he should have gotten an Oscar for that, really. It's uncanny. So uh, for those of you who haven't heard about this terrible movie, uh, I recommend you watch Johnny Mnemonic. Uh, it was also published in about 1995. By the way, if you do watch it, uh, you'll notice that there was a lot of technology that was foreseen in this movie, including the world's first iPhone. Yes, if you watch Johnny Mnemonic 1995, there is an iPhone in that movie, I promise you. And that's where Steve Jobs got the idea. Okay, maybe not. Uh, anyway, really these movies where people have, uh, you know, digital memories instead of their minds, implanted memories, constructed memories, or in the case of Robocop, where a human being was actually essentially completely rebuilt using technology, we again have to think about where is the human and where is the machine, and what is the boundaries. And if we think about implanted memories, so what is authentic and what is not? And what does it matter? Uh, in Ghost in the Shell, which I've, I've shown you a, a few sections from that, the major Kusanagi, who is uh, this lethal femme fatale android in charge of a police unit in Tokyo, is actually almost completely synthetic. Only her brain remains uh, organic. And in this movie, we also encounter a completely new type of entity, an electronic entity created from bits and bytes of information. So really, we, we are already coming to the age of having electronic entities alive on the nets around us. We really have to start thinking about new types of humanity, I feel. And a uh, very important piece of cyberpunk, perhaps one of the most well-known ones, is the novel Neuromancer from 1982. So William Gibson first imagined a world where an interconnected network brings together minds of people. In this book, there's even uh, the ghost of a hacker which has been maintained in a hard drive. And he's called the Flatline. And he actually helps uh, the hero along in his quest. And this was before the real internet was even around, 1982. So you could say he really uh, imagined this reality before it, uh, it came into being. By the way, if you've read Neuromancer, how many of you have read Neuromancer or heard about it? I recommend you also read the other two books. It's actually part of a trilogy, uh, and those are listed up there as well. Uh, okay, 1999. Lots of exciting things happened. Uh, the Matrix movie came out. I don't know about you guys, but as far as I'm concerned, there's only one Matrix movie. That's it, right? Can we agree on that one? 
great. So uh, a couple of other things happened in 1999. Like, uh, do you remember the Y2K bug? Oh yeah, it did nothing. But lots of people made lots of money over the Y2K bug. And in fact, humanity was terrified by the concept of billions of electronic machines worldwide clicking the date and, you know, zeroing it out and what might happen. In fact, airlines wouldn't fly. There are only seven flights up in the air at midnight Greenwich Mean Time. In fact, I know a person that was on aboard one of those flights. It was a publicity stunt by British Airways. And this person told me about it. He was actually one of seven people on the flight. And in fact, they were all journalists because nobody wanted to fly. So British Airways gave these first class tickets on a completely empty flight from London to New York on midnight, December 31st, 1999. And all of these journalists had to really come up with a story. So what they ended up doing, and this is a secret, don't tell anyone I told you is that they interviewed each other and like the Israeli journalist interviewed the German journalist and he told him yes I'm an Israeli on vacation and then the German journalist said he's a German businessman and so on and so forth and exactly one minute after midnight Greenwich Mean Time they heard this incredible pop from the cockpit everyone started panicking they were already on nerves and then the pilots came out with a big bottle of champagne and they all had a great party on the plane so just, just a little bit of side talk about the white of k bug. Going back to the Matrix, really this movie I think inspired hundreds of thousands of people worldwide to rethink really about their reality. Think about how you felt when you came out of the movie theater after you've watched this movie. I don't know about you guys, but I remember going out to the streets, it was dark, it was rainy, it was foggy, and I started looking at everything and questioning everything. Is this the physical reality? Or is it just a construct in my mind? And if so, so what? You know, we really have to start thinking about how we perceive reality, what's real, what's going to happen, how, how realistic are the feelings, the emotions, our memories. All of these questions are really, I feel, a little bit unanswered. And that's really the key themes for cyberpunk movies and books, is really exploring these questions, these ideas of virtual identity, physical reality, what's authentic, what's not, what's digital, what's analog. And it's a crazy world, right? Uh, but now um, I want to tell you another secret about the Matrix movie. Perhaps you've heard this, perhaps not. Anyone here know this guy? If you can't see him, please, we still have a couple of seats here. Anyone know this guy? I will give you a special prize if you know who this guy is. Uh, you, uh, dear, are exempt. My fiance is there, so he cannot answer. Uh, anyone? Anyone? Okay, this guy is actually Stanislav Lem, uh, the Polish science fiction writer. Have you heard about him? He also wrote Solaris, not the operating system, for those of you who know it. Uh, so in 1971, Mr. Lem wrote an amazing book. It's called The Futurological Congress. I uh, even managed to find, uh, this is the Hebrew cover, this is the English cover, and this is the German cover. Uh, I don't know if you can see it. It's an incredible book. And really, so many things that are happening right now in the world, in the 21st century, he's already imagined that stuff, and it's all in the book. But you know what else is in the book? Lots of scenes from The Matrix. Yeah, so I guess the Wachowski brothers also read this book. In fact, there's a scene including the red pill and the blue pill and what happens when you take it and how your perception of reality changes. So if you guys want to know the real origins for The Matrix, you better pick up this book from 1971. Right, so now I want to talk to you a little bit about hackers who are my heroes. Really, the hackers of fiction and of reality uh, could be seen as an evolution of the film noir style detective, especially if you think about Blade Runner. That's kind of like still in film noir, but moving into cyberpunk. They definitely operate outside of mainstream society, non-conforming. They have an own code, their own self of honor, of code, a co moral compass all to their own about what's right, what's wrong, what's fun, what's boring. That's a quote from a movie. And they sometimes can be even seen as vigilantes. If you consider hacker organizations uh, in the world right now and hacktivists, that's definitely the truth. And they have temporary alliances and adversaries and groups that they operate in and out of. So pretty cool heroes. And I want to give a shout out to a couple of these heroes 
that have definitely been an inspiration to me in the past, and that includes the hackers from Neuromancer, a uh, hero protagonist from Snow Crash, another fantastic movie, uh, sorry, book, uh, Captain Crunch, a real hacker, The Analyzer, an Israeli hacker, uh, a couple more over there, especially Neo, Morpheus, and Trinity, of course, Crash Override, Serial Killer, and especially Acid Burn. Anyone here ever heard about Acid Burn? Yeah, well, I'm sure that you've heard about uh, a very special girl that her nickname was Acid Burn. So, in fact, in 1995, the movie Hackers came out. It was based on research about a real group of hackers operating in New York. The journalist who wrote the book wrote about two, uh, two years of research in order to write it. And uh, this movie really inspired me, actually. When I was 14 and I watched it, I immediately wanted to follow in the footsteps of Angelina Jolie. Because Angelina Jolie, then before surgeries and before becoming a Hollywood uh, blockbuster mega queen as we know her today, she played the young hacker Acid Burn. I was 14 at the time and I saw this amazing, proactive, strong woman that is just being really, really cool and, and being a hacker with all of the guys and I want to be just like her. I'm serious, that's why I do what I do. So I think more girls can be inspired by these types of role models, right? And if we consider this girl, okay, Trinity, she is amazing. She is the killer, no bullshit, uh, razor sharp uh, companion to Neo. She kicks ass and she's really amazing when she does it. Uh, and of course, who hasn't heard about Lisbeth Salander, the girl with the dragon tattoo? How many of you here have read the books or seen the movies? Have you seen the movie, read the book? Okay, so it's Swedish literature. Uh, let me warn you, there is a chapter where she goes to Ikea and there is a list of all of the shelves and tables that she buys in Ikea. No, seriously, it's true. But again, this is a really cool hacker girl and it's an incredible role model. And I really feel like we need more of those to get more women uh, involved into hacking. In fact, I'm going to write my own uh, cyberpunk uh, fiction book soon. So. Let's go back now uh, to reality and towards uh, the second part of the talk, I want to leave some time for questions. We have some time for questions, right? Good. So going back to reality, uh, this is the team, the real team that made cyberspace possible. So after hearing about cyberspace and reading about it in science fiction books, it actually became a reality. This is the group of DARPA. American and uh, European scientists that created the first network called DARPA or ARPANET that became uh, the mother of the internet. They really imagined a new reality which, you know, we are all here right now because of that. Uh, unfortunately, there weren't any girls on that team. But, you know, we are going to change that in the, in the near future. And uh, in the 90s really was the most exciting age for the information revolution just starting. Organizations like the EFF, the Real Electronic Frontiers Foundation. Have you heard about the EFF? By the way, it's about 20 years old now. So the EFF is a very, I'll tell you about it because you haven't heard about it. Uh, it's a very cool group uh, based in America and they, ha they have lawyers and they do legislation and lobbying. And these guys really make sure that if you're a hacker and you're doing things for the good, then you won't get prosecuted. They help hackers that do get prosecuted. They're the guys that made it legal for Americans to jailbreak their iPhone after a very lengthy process. They are the guys that are fighting net neutrality in America. So really a new organization or a 20 year old organization organization uh, taking charge of our rights online. Um, another thing that happened in the 90s is the real hacker manifesto and the cyberpunk handbook came out. And when I say came out, I mean that they were published on bulletin board systems, electronic forums and other corners of the dark or the then dark internet. And they really describe the principles of what it is to become a real hacker, to seek for knowledge, to seek for information, to be free. Uh, to untie boundaries and access. And this is a reality, it's not science fiction. And then DEF CON. Anyone here heard about DEF CON? Cool. So I just came back from DEF CON 20. Let me tell you, best DEF CON yet. DEF CON is the world's largest hacker conference. Uh, it's about this big, maybe a little bigger. 10,000 hackers get together in Las Vegas every last weekend of July for 20 years and they go up to all kinds of trouble and it's a lot of fun. And this year we also had the most women at DEF CON yet. 
and I'm definitely working to increase those odds for the coming years as well. So really we have DEF CON, which is a large hacker conference taking place for 20 years, uh, 2,600, 2,600, uh, which have their meetings, and HOPE, which is hackers on planet Earth, and now they've had meetings in Europe as well. This is a reality. Uh, now let's go back 30 years ago. Does anyone know this, uh, this image? Raise your hands. Let's give a moment to those who haven't uh, found out yet. Take a moment. Any more? Anyone else? So uh, for those of you who can't see it, uh, this is a computer screen describing a choice, a menu. And on the menu, we have a couple of choices. We have chess, poker, fighter combat, ooh, guerrilla engagement, desert warfare, air to ground actions, theater wide tactical warfare, theater wide biotoxic and chemical warfare, and for dessert, global thermonuclear war. So if you haven't recognized it yet, of course, this is a screen from the very famous movie War Games that came out in 1983. And in this movie, uh, the young Matthew Broderick, uh, whom you might know as Ferris Bueller, uh, is able to hack from his basement into a computer system controlling a war gaming simulation system of the American missile control. And in effect, this young hacker from his basement can al almost launches a total nuclear uh, war. And this was, you know, a terrible nightmare scenario when it was described by Hollywood in 1983. Now let's fast forward to modern hacking. 2010, Stuxnet, the world's first cyber weapon, a piece of computer code that can actually make an effect in physical reality, manipulate centrifuges in Iranian uranium uh, enrichment factories. This is a reality. It's not the science fiction of, of Hollywood. This is the age we live in right now, the age of cyber conflict, and it's real. And it's not going anywhere. It's the 21st century. So just think about that. And I know it's a bit terrifying. Think about the hacker groups out there, anonymous, hacktivism, these groups are, on a daily basis, influencing reality, disrupting and uh, infiltrating into computer systems, liberating information, as is the case with WikiLeaks, getting the message out there, changing calls from day to day. They are a bit, a bit chaotic. But I feel that hacking can also be a chaotic force for good. It's build versus break. And if we can build things, we definitely should do that. All right. So what I've told you so far is that cyberpunk fiction has inspired the reality of hacker culture today. And it's a 21st century type of power, hacking. And it's here to stay. And I'm definitely eager to see more women enter into the space. Uh, so I've actually listed up a couple of uh, women involved, uh, including Joanna Rutkowska, a very cool Polish hacker, uh, Jerry Ellsworth, Limor Fried, Hillary Mason, Kayla Hamlin, Del Harvey, if you don't know her, she's the chief security for Twitter, pretty awesome girl, Linux Chicks, Women Who Code, and the Grace Hopper celebration of women in computing. And actually, do you know the woman in this image? Can you see it? Guys in the back, can you see it? So anyone recognize it? Of course you don't. This is from a computer game that was designed in the 90s, but never published. The reason I have this image is because I actually modeled for that character. So that's actually me, or how the game designers wanted me to look like in the game. It was pretty cool, lots of live action, but it never came out. So I'm sorry, the Israeli uh, game uh, scene wasn't very good in the 90s. We're still working on that. So uh, as we end, I'd like to call on to you, girls and guys, get more involved with hacking as a power for good, and let's hack the planet. So thank you so much for your time today. Thank you. And before we go to questions, uh, if anyone wants to reach me or try to hack my uh, inbox, I don't recommend it. Uh, here's my information up there. It's my Gmail, my LinkedIn, and my Twitter handle. And you're very welcome to contact me in any of those methods. If you'll come up to me and you'd like to have a, a real printed business card, I don't have any. So it's the digital age. Why don't you contact me on cyberspace? And at this point, I'd like to take questions from the audience, if we have time for that. And I think that we do. Any questions? 
if you don't have any questions, I have more stuff that I can show you, if you like that. Some pretty cool stuff. What's that? Oh yeah, one question back there. Yeah. Uh, no, I'm interested in your experience, uh, what you were saying about DEF CON, because there's been so much talk about harassment of women there. Yeah. And uh, you just like said in this off sentence, like, I'm really encouraging more women to come there, but Definitely. practically, how do you do it? Okay, so that's a very good question. Thank you for that. And I'll just repeat the question for those of you who might not have heard it. So that lady's question was, really, how can I encourage more women to come to hacker conferences like DEF CON because of uh, some talk that there's been about inappropriate behavior by guys in DEF CON and harassment and etc. So I'd like to take that question uh, uh, head on. First off, I'd like to tell you that for next DEF CON, I'm actually going to do a talk about how to be a girl at DEF CON and how to be there and it's going to probably be on one of the first days. Because for DEF CON every year on the first day, we have a DEF CON 101 session for noobs, people that have never been to DEF CON and we kind of talk through things and I'm definitely going to do that. But right now, practically speaking, DEF CON has been around for 20 years and uh, the hacker community is evolving, it's maturing. So and a community that used to be very young, perhaps even juvenile, is now becoming more mature. And there is definitely place for women, even for kids, to come to DEF CON. In fact, this year we even had DEF CON Kids, which was a separate area with competitions just for people to bring their family. We had a six-year-old girl capturing packets using Wireshark on the network. Personally, I find that's pretty awesome on the awesome scale. Thank you. And we, every year we do more stuff to get more families involved. Now, in terms of the, the behavior of, of some people at DEF CON, inappropriate behavior, uh, I'm definitely not justifying it. I, I definitely think that while it might discourage some women from attending, they should, however, still attend. You just have to be smart about it. You just have to be very proactive. You have to make sure that if somebody says something to you or does something to you, you put them on the spot then and there. Uh, in fact, this year we had one woman that have printed cards, yellow card and red cards. And if somebody was doing something not so cool or saying something not so cool, they might get a yellow card. And if they were really crossing the line, they'd get a red card. And the red card says on it, dude, get lost. And, you know, people getting those cards will feel pretty silly about themselves. Sometimes they might not be aware of their behavior. They might just be under the influence of being in the company of so many other young men and also being in Las Vegas, otherwise known as Sin City, which can elicit some inappropriate behavior. Now, I've been going to DEF CON for a while. I've experienced some of that behavior myself. Uh, it's just a matter of really watching out for yourself, surrounding yourself by people you trust. So even if you don't know anyone there, which by the way, the first time I came out to DEF CON, I didn't know anyone. I reached out to a couple of my connections, people I only knew virtually, and I met up with them in very safe places, very public places, and I made sure that I know people all the time. And now each year that I go, I make sure to surround myself with people that I trust, that are cool, even though it's guys, and I just try to watch out for myself, and if somebody does something which is not cool, I put him on the spot. Uh, however, I would definitely say to girls and women, keep on coming to DEF CON. Don't stay at home, because if you stay at home, that's just silly. You know, that's, we're not getting anywhere. Come out, join. This is how I learned everything I know, by going out to the world, meeting hackers, organizing hacker conferences, finding people that know more than I do, and not being ashamed to say, hey, I'm a noob, teach me. I want to know how to do what you do. That's how you get into this world, not by staying in, in your you know, apartment. You come out to the world. And you send a message of being friendly and being cool, and you hope that people will respect that message. Any further questions? Yes, sir, you. Let's get the mic. Thank you, Felipe. Oh, we have lots of time. Hey. hey. Uh, I have one comment and one question. Uh, the comment Hold the mic closer so we can hear you. Okay. Good. The comment would be, um, wh what do you think about that, like, this Turing test has now been, like, turned around. Now it most of the time, you have to identify that you're a human and not a machine. Yeah. And think about those implications. I think it's very interesting and scary in a way. That's a good point. So actually, one of the things that uh, we, we at Singularity University are working on a lot is the topic of artificial intelligence and how artificial intelligence and virtual constructs 
digital identities, avatars are really coming into our reality right now. It's not you know, something that's going to happen in 50 years. It's nowadays. And there are actually some legal questions as well. Are they considered real entities? Is IBM's Watson, is that a real person? Is it not? What's the difference? How, how do we actually differentiate selfhood as, and personhood from a digital construct, a dig digital identity? And even scarier than what you just asked me uh, are uh, those projects that are aiming to actually maintain someone's mental state, thoughts, emotions, memories, in some form of digital memory that could be uploaded and then perhaps downloaded to a new body. So that's really in the realm of science fiction for me, but it's becoming a reality. I've actually met people who are seriously working on those projects. Uh, some of my students in Singularity University are working on those projects, for real. So uh, the problem there is that while technology is advancing at an accelerating pace, human society in terms of legal constructs, in terms of policy, in terms of concepts, how we speak, how we think about these things, hasn't moved as fast, right? So while technology is here, the you know, human state is kind of here. We really have to get up there. Otherwise, technology will rule us, and not us technology, right? So it's not, I don't have a solution. I, I agree with you, it's, it's very complicated. Does that and answer the yeah, question? Yeah, please. And uh, my question would be, um, what is your stance on the Internet Defense League? Sorry about that? The Internet Defense League. Uh, I, can't say, I, I can't say that uh, I have a concrete stance on it in terms of if I'm pro or against it. Personally, I prefer projects that are trying to be constructive and that are trying to raise awareness and that are trying to build versus break. So that's the type of things that I would encourage. Um, However, we have to be realistic, and in this day and age, hacking is definitely used for bad stuff as well. And on the spectrum between a white hat hacker, which is kind of like a good hacker, and a black hat hacker, you know, there is lots of gray. And all of the hackers that I've actually met in real life, well, except for maybe two guys, everyone have been really on the gray scale. And so there are all kinds of people out there, right? And uh, that's what I have to say about that. Uh, any more questions? Oh, I can show you more cool stuff. Cool stuff? Cool stuff? Okay, let's see more cool stuff. Uh, so this is Transmetropolitan. Yeah, you like that? Cool. Uh, this is actually a very cool graphic novel by uh, Warren Ellis. And it also, I think, came out in the late 90s or early noughties, as we call it, the year 2000 and on. And this is the, the hero of the Transmetropolitan uh, uh, book. He's called Spider. And if you see him in the picture, I don't know if you can read it, it says, uh, uh, hello, I'm a journalist. So this guy is really all about uncovering the truth uh, in the world. And if you're into this kind of thing, I'm sure that you like uh, Transmetropolitan. Uh, another interesting uh, work is actually V4 Vendetta. Now, V4 Vendetta is a little bit con contended because a lot of people don't think about it as cyberpunk. Uh, however, I do recommend that if you like the movie V for Vendetta, uh, pick up the graphic novel it's based on by literary genius Alan Moore. He's also the creator of Watchmen and, you know, just an amazing uh, writer. And in the, in the graphic novel, I think more elements of cyberpunk definitely come, come out, uh, especially the revolt against an authoritarian government, the role of technology and surveillance in human society, and the vigilantism. And of course, it is no coincidence that hacker organization Anonymous have chosen this face or the Guy, Guy Fox mask uh, to become their, their uh, signal. There's a very strong connection here. By the way, there is another connection here uh, to the movie Matrix, which I've shown uh, and spoken to you about earlier. Does anyone know the connection? Anyone? What's that? I can't hear you, sorry. The voice? Well, actually, what's really interesting, uh, except for the fact that it's the, the Wachowski brothers, right, produced V for Vendetta, uh, do you know who actually plays V in the V for Vendetta movie? Who, who is the voice behind the mask? Yeah, that, that's, the guy from Matrix. that's right, that's Agent Smith. This is Hugo Weaving, brilliant Australian actor, also known for his role as Priscilla, Queen of the Desert. 
little bit different. Uh, and I don't think it's chance that the Wachowski brothers chose Agent Smith, who is the rogue AI in the Matrix, this very chaotic element that's really bringing lots of new things into the world. And they chose to, to give the same voice to V, the vigilante for V for Vendetta. And that's just me and one of my fans over there uh, from a, a costume party. Uh, okay, moving on. Cyberpunk, the role-playing game. So I don't know if you guys remember, but in the 80s and 90s, uh, role-playing games that actually took place with books and dice and tables, not computer games, were really, really popular. In fact, I can tell you that I was such a geek when I was growing up that the group playing D&D &D in my class wouldn't let me join. I was too much of a geek for those guys playing D&D. &D. Well, I feel like I should meet them now and I will kick their ass with my cyborg boot. No, but really, Cyberpunk was a role-playing game uh, that uh, gained some popularity, and it really talked about, uh, I don't know if you can read it, it says, the role-playing game of the dark future. So that basically says it all. Uh, another cool role-playing game is Shadowrun. Anyone here ever heard about Shadowrun? Yay! Well, you guys should know, I have the first edition Hebrew version of Shadowrun manual in my house. It's so rare because nobody <laughs> read that. I actually have lots of Shadowrun books. So Shadowrun was a role-playing game uh, that also came out in those days. And they also threw in, except for technology and humans, magic. Why? Because it's cool. So this was a pretty cool uh, role-playing game. You can imagine your um, magical ninja, dragon metamorphosizing hacker and have lots of fun in your basement in the dark. And Paranoia, that is another cool uh, role-playing game. Again, kind of popular in the 80s and 90s. I feel like we're living in those days that these uh, role-playing games imagined, right? Uh, let's see what we have. Oh, I have, okay, more stuff for you. So why don't you guys think about this? In the, in the first days of the 20th century, people were only first imagining the role of technology in, in life and robots. For example, the robot Maria from Metropolis and how they will liberate the masses. Well, women were just getting liberated themselves then, right? Uh, what about World War II? World War II gave lots of power to two groups, women and computers. So in fact, the, the women in that image are the world's first programmers. They're not the world's first female programmers, they're just the world's first programmers. They were the six women that work with ENIAC uh, electronic computer in America. And these computers, these room-sized machines were developed in World War II. So that's only part of the opportunities that were created. Women were getting the opportunity to take technical jobs in factories and get the job that he left behind, like that poster says. So a pretty incredible uh, parallel narrative right there. And in the 60s and 80s, women were uh, imagining more rights, liberties, sexual revolution, while these guys were working on the next generation, the network, ARPANET, DARPA, the internet. So really, I think it's a parallel evolution. It's pretty cool. Uh, this is the same, uh, same team. So today, we have women in positions of power. We have Marissa Meyer from Google, now Yahoo and uh, Sheryl Zandberg for Facebook, Kanzler Merkel, of course, and uh, Ms. Clinton in America. So women have gotten to all of those positions of power, but I think they're still missing out on hacking as a form of power. And again, I'd like to thank you for your time because we are just about done now, yeah? Unless there are any more questions? Any questions? Yes, yes, okay. Oh, Greek guy, you missed out on your opportunity. Yes, but I have a question now. Sure, yeah, go ahead. What about the need in the hacking community and in general, in the geek community or whatever you want to call it, uh, to update their uh, kind of uh, philosophical or ideological or whatever you may call it background? Like, for example, the Matrix uh, is a very bad edition of simulacral simulation, and Batroyard has uh, disqualified the Matrix as a very low-grade uh, copy of um, its ideas, and this is very rarely brought up at uh, cyber culture events or uh, geek events which speak about the Matrix. Or what about the fact that uh, Anonymous only started using the masks of Viper Vendetta after the movie came out, which is also being disqualified by Yala Moore? What about all this kind of problem? Isn't there a need for uh, 
some kind of ideological update, I would call it. Uh. Okay, so you said a bunch of things. Let me just try and wrap it up. Basically, you said that the Matrix movie wasn't original. So, dude, you really should have been here on time, because I also said that. But thanks for that note. That's cool. Uh, I, take the, I take the comment. Yes, the Matrix movie is based on a bunch of ideas, including simul acra and simulation, uh, which is actually uh, referenced in the movie. So there's a scene where you can actually see that book in the movie, by the way. And uh, they've also used a, another uh, bunch of ideas. But the question you're trying to make is that the ideological background for a hacker culture should come from places that are not these Hollywood movies? Is that what you're trying to say? Updated? Because it's from the 80s. Okay, so very well, you know what, I agree. It's the 21st century and we definitely need to have a 21st century uh, point of view. Uh, perhaps we even need to think about the role of intellectual property in this age, if that's even a concept that maintains, you know, because that's also something from the 20th century. And I agree with you that hacker groups and hacker culture today needs new manifestos, new ideologies, uh, new, new concepts. The reality, however, is anonymous are already doing whatever they want. So they're not waiting for you or for me to write down their new philosophies, right? They're just, like uh, Nike says or Yossi Vardy, they're just doing it. Right? They're just hacking and they're changing their ideological point of view on a day-to-day -day basis. In fact, Anonymous is not even one group or one organization. So maybe we have some Anons here in the audience. Hello? Anyone want to step up? Okay, maybe in a couple of days you'd like to expose yourself. We, we haven't met each other yet. But uh, the point I'm saying is that I agree with you. There is definitely the time for a change of mind, a change of ideology. The question is, will it come from one person or from one book or one movie? Or will it be crowdsourced and from the bottom up, a new vision for the masses? That's what I would like to see. Hack the planet. Thank you. Anyone else? No? OK, thank you, guys. Thank you. Now yeah, we have a break until uh, next Yeah, day. we have a break from 10 minutes and then we are going to have Dr. Ian Bird on stage. Yeah, if you want.